When it comes to your retirement, what do you think will have a more significant impact on your bottom line? Having a tax-efficient retirement plan or your portfolio's performance? Well, if you ask any sort of financial publication, I can almost guarantee that they're going to say your portfolio's performance. Very rarely do they spend any time going over useful tax strategies that you can use during your retirement. Well, the point of this video is to turn that narrative on its head because ultimately having a tax efficient retirement plan is going to put you in a much better position than earning an extra half percent on your portfolio. So how do we do this? Let's go through an example. Tim is 59 and his wife Macy is 58 and they are newly retired. They would like to be able to spend $7,500 per month increasing with inflation over the next 20 years. So after those 20 years will be close to age 80, at which point they'll be doing less travel and they figure that they're going to need $5,500 per month. They plan on taking their CPP as soon as they're eligible at age 60 and for old age security, they planned on starting that at 65. So to live off $7,500 per month, they would need to start drawing on their portfolio. So currently, Tim had $140,000 in his tax-free savings account and $600,000 in his RSP, and Macy had $150,000 in her TFSA with $800,000 in their RSP. They jointly had a non-registered account valued at $350,000, and in this first scenario that we're going to look at, let's assume a rate of return of 6% on their portfolio. All right, so as mentioned, we're using a rate of return of 6% in this initial example, and Tim and Macy's plan in retirement was to draw on their TFSAs first. They like this idea because any withdrawals from their TFSA would incur any tax, and they also like the idea of deferring the tax bill on their RSPs as long as possible. So as you can see here on the graph of their net worth, over the next four years, they're drawing down their TFSAs, and once they are depleted, they can start drawing on their non-registered accounts. So about 10 years down the road, they're going to have used up all of their non-registered and TFSA money, and they're going to be forced to start drawing on their RSPs. So we see a pretty steep decline over the following 10 years or so, but then things level out. Now, the reason that things level out is, again, we're lowering their expenses 20 years from now to $5,500 per month. We also see a TFSA start appearing. So the reason for that is that the mandated withdrawals that they're having to take from their RIFs are more than they actually need to meet their expenses of $5,500 per month. Again, once you factor in CPP and OAS as well. So that extra money is going into their TFSA. So this plan goes up until age 90. So uh, Macy's a year younger. So by the time she's 90, there's a bit of money in the TFSA, but the bulk of their portfolio is still in the registered account. So at that point, a uh, RIF. So the RIF is going to be fully taxable to the estate. So we're seeing a final tax bill of $558,000, leaving a net estate after tax of $985,000. So in my opinion, this is not a plan that is optimized. There's a lot of strategies that we can implement to make this plan look even better. But again, the point of this video was to show the impact of portfolio performance versus tax efficient planning. So to do that, let's reduce their rate of return on their portfolio from six down to five and a half percent. So this will be the second scenario that we look at. So just by reducing uh, their return down to five and a half percent, we see their net worth graph here change pretty substantially. There's a lot less remaining in the TFSA. And now we're left with a net estate of 429,000. So about a $550,000 decrease compared to the first scenario that we looked at. But with proper planning, can we get that net estate back to where it was before? And we'll use that as our barometer for success in these two examples. So the first strategy that I would recommend is to delay receiving CPP to age 70. Now, the benefit of this is that by deferring your CPP to 70 every year that you defer it or every month, actually, you're going to get an increase to your CPP. So if you take it at 70 and again, life expectancy in this plan is age 90, you're going to be a lot better off by deferring it to 70. So that means you're going to spend more of your own money at the onset of retirement, but over time, it's going to be beneficial. So just by making that one change, we can now see the net estate increase to $738,000. So $300,000 more than where we were at that baseline at 5.5%. Let's also do the same thing with old age security. So again, typically that one starts at 65, but you can defer it to 70 and receive a bonus as well. So by implementing this strategy, now we've increased our net estate by another $60,000. So we're pretty close to where we were in that first scenario with very little planning and a higher rate of return. 
So that's our first strategy, simply changing the start dates on our government pensions. Now, all else being equal, we don't want to play around with any of the variables that we're using. So inflation, expenses, and their life expenses. You want to keep those all the same. So for our second strategy, we really want to focus on the withdrawal order. So where they are drawing funds in retirement. So if you recall in scenario one, they were drawing on their TFSAs first, which was good in the sense that they weren't paying a lot of taxes at the beginning of retirement, but this would have a negative impact in the long run. So I would say it's short-term gain for long-term pain with that strategy. So we want to sort of flip that on its head and focus more on those registered withdrawals. So what we want to do is target a taxable income of $50,000 thousand dollars per year for both of them so again if we're deferring cpp and oas to age 70 that's primarily going to come from rsb withdrawals and maybe a little bit of income from their joint non-registered portfolio but as we can see from the graph here we're being a lot more aggressive with our registered withdrawals so they're being drawn down much quicker into retirement so we're not leaving a huge estate tax bill at the end of the plan we're also making slate withdrawals from the non-registered account just to top them up, again, so that they can keep spending that $7,500 per month. The other benefit of this strategy is that we're leaving their TFSAs alone to keep growing over time. So that means over the next 30 years of their retirement, TFSAs keep growing, it's all tax-free, and at the plan's end, again, that's going to leave a much bigger net estate value. So just by making that one change, we've now increased our net estate to $1.47 million. So for our final strategy, we're going to want to keep topping up their TFSAs every year. Now that we're not drawing on them first in retirement and we're letting them grow over the next 30 years or so, we want to keep adding to them. So what we're going to do is rather than having money in their joint non-registered account that's exposed to tax every year on any interest or dividends they make, we want to make sure that we're funneling that money every year to their TFSAs to keep topping them up. So again, so that change is going to increase their net worth by about $35,000. So now we're sitting at $1.51 million. So even though our rate of return is less, again, we're using 5.5% in the second scenario compared to the first scenario, which we're using 6%, Tim and Macy are going to be in a much better position. Now they have a net estate of $1.51 million compared to the no planning scenario where they'd be leaving $985,000. Now, obviously, if you can have good investment performance and match that up with a tax efficient retirement plan, you're going to be in an even better position. So let's just keep all our strategies the same, but increase the rate of return back up to 6%. Now our net estate is over $2 million, which is essentially a million dollars more than the first scenario we looked at. So tax planning is super important. So I would say if you have an hour a day to commit to your finances, rather than watching, let's call it the financial news and trying to get information to earn maybe a half percent better rate of return on your portfolio, I would say that hour is better spent on looking at strategies from a tax perspective to optimize your retirement. And at the end of the day, tax planning is something you can actually control. You can see the benefits of implementing these strategies, whereas when it comes to investing, there's no guarantees that any changes you make will result in better performance. For all your retirement needs, check us out at transcanadawealthmanagement.com.